the Teaching Tax Flow podcast, where the goal is to empower and educate you to legally and ethically minimize taxes paid over your lifetime. Good day, everybody, and welcome to episode 49 here on the Teaching Tax Flow podcast. Today's topic, we are going to dive directly into headfirst. We're going to talk about how taxes are made. Yes, you heard that right. Actually, how taxes are made. How do we make these things we know as taxes? But before we jump into it and meet our guest, let's take a moment as always and thank our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Legacy Lock. If you are new to estate planning or simply need to review your current plan, Legacy Lock makes it as easy as pie. Legacy Lock is a unique platform that enables you to easily complete your attorney drafted documents conveniently from the comfort of your home or office. Your first step to this peace of mind is simply visiting teachingtaxflow.com slash legacy. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Teaching Tax Flow, the podcast. We know you're, we're your favorite podcast. So if you haven't subscribed to us yet, do it, um, and we'll find out. If you haven't, you're in big trouble. So that's why I hang out with a bunch of CPAs, a bunch of these smart tax pros. They are smarter than I am, and we make things happen. So I am John Trapolsky. Without further ado, Chris Pacuro is back on with us again, the founder of TTF. I won't read off all of his credentials because we'll be here all day, as always. But Chris, how's it going, bud? It is going great. I'm very, very excited about our guest today. Um, one of the three laws of teaching tax flow is that gov- uh, tax agencies are your involuntary business partner. So we talk a lot about tax laws, tax rules, how we can legally and ethically reduce the tax you're paying in your lifetime. But what we don't talk about is how taxes are made. How do things get from an idea or a concept or a feeling that we want to change a behavior to an actual law. And we are going to dive into that today. Awesome. And, uh, well, let's start, our let's peel back the onion. Association of CPAs is here. And you know what, what's funny, Chris, is you know, I've been hearing you for so long saying MICPA, MICPA. I'm like, what in the world is MICPA? Until I got familiar with it, obviously. But we went to an event that they put on a couple months ago now um, on the west side of the state. And... I'm really excited about this. So we met this fantastic person who is joining us today at the event. We were just chatting it up. Um, I don't even remember how the conversation started, but all of a sudden, I think we asked each other, well, well, what do you do? Like, who are you with? And lo and behold, her title is Director of Government Relations for MICPA. So, what's up, Thomas? How are you doing today? Thank you for joining us. I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I, w- I was going to say, you know, you made us all feel dumb, but that doesn't take a whole lot sometimes. I mean, me and, me and Chris <laughs> back and forth, you know. No, she didn't make us feel dumb. I think that if we knew that she was uh, the director of government relations, we may not have had the, the gall to actually talk to her. So it's just probably good we didn't know her position, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, again, thanks, thanks for joining us. Again, this is a great topic. One that, you know, we really didn't even expect to do because we didn't know who to really reach out to mm-hmm. touch on this topic. So maybe the best place to start with this is maybe first how you even got into this. Like, does somebody go to the, you know, director of, of government <laughs> relations program um, in college or, or how does this work? And also I did to point out the fact that we have two Michiganders on this episode and one guy who left us and moved to te- or Tennessee. So you're outnumbered here, Chris. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> That's all right, John. Uh, all right. Well, again, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, I enjoyed, you know, greatly talking to you in, in um, West Michigan. And um, so just a little bit about my background. Um, I um, actually am a mountaineer. I went to school at um, West Virginia University. And um, my degree is in broadcast journalism. So actually, it's um, I when I started off, I really had every intention of being a television reporter. And, um, you know, life happened. And then um, I worked for, um, I worked as an executive assistant for many years. And then um, at uh, a previous company, I um, got into advocacy. I had been there for several years. And um, this opportunity came up to work in the uh, advocacy department. It was in uh, at a healthcare organization, and um, I fell in love with it then. You know, so I had you know a lot of people may start off like in political science or 
you know, those type of fields. But actually, I just kind of fell into it. And, um, you know, through that experience um, at this particular health organization, we um, were very much, this was very much at the time when uh, the Affordable Health um, Affordable Health Care Act was being um, discussed. And um, so it was an interesting time. So I learned a great deal. Um, we had um, advocacy directors at um, all over we, the, the hospital had or the, the organization had hospitals across the country. And so I worked at the corporate office. And so I got a taste of how things worked at, you know, they're in various states. Um, but my role there was not director. My role there was actually an analyst. And um, soon after that, I was um, tapped by um, Mayor Maureen Miller Brosnan with the city of Livonia. And um, I was asked to lead the government relations department there. So I was with um, city government for a couple of years. And then um, now I am with the MICPA. So awesome. I've kind of been in different industries, started off in uh, really automotive right off the bat. You know, I was basically just, you know, an assistant there and then automotive and then healthcare, and then government and now accounting. So yeah, that's, a, that's a great perspective because the, 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 a lot of times people say oh, government is all local. And you started at that local level mm -hmm. uh, and now working with the Michigan Association of CPAs and and they outreach up to the American Institute of CPAs and uh, network with other state CPA societies. Mm -hmm. Before we jump into the how it, how taxes are made, um, I think it's important for listeners to understand the tax preparation and accounting business. And mm -hmm. when they're working with the with a tax professional, we talk about in our uh, practice consulting the uh, a monthly recurring revenue monthly recurring revenue institute. Uh, a, a lot of times with that division that uh, you don't, you're just because you get paid doesn't make you a pro. So when we use that term tax pro, uh, you know, I want, I want the general public to understand who they're working with, to feel protected because there are certified public accountants, there are enrolled agents, there are other designations that have to live under something called percolating perks in our healthcare fair standard. But unfortunately in many states, I mean, I know you're in the state of Michigan, uh, mm -hmm. and I say this, John usually brings the fact up that I am bald. Uh, I know that. <laughs> oh, it was coming. Don't worry. I had it written down right here. <laughs> it's harder to, it's harder to get it out of the I didn't even notice. <laughs> hey, you know what? <laughs> you know what I it's harder for you to get a cosmetology license than open up a tax preparation business. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Lachelle, can you kind of touch on, and I know uh, specifically with the CPA and their role and and kind of what differentiates a CPA from a tax, a tax prof, uh, other tax professionals, um, in in what, what the MICPA does for those folks? Absolutely, yes. So, um, there you know there is a big difference between an accountant and a CPA, and you know obviously that's not to say that accountants aren't important because we need people who are going to do a, va a vast majority of all kinds of um, services. Um, but one of the main differences between someone who is just in finance or accounting um, as opposed to someone who's a CPA is that CPAs um, require specific education and they have to uh, be licensed by the state. And um, in order to be licensed by the state, actually, um, if you don't mind, I'll just um, quickly give an a overview of um, how uh, it, what's required to become a CPA here in Michigan. That'd be perfect. So um, again, CPAs are licensed at the state level. Um, the, the license comes from the Bureau of Professional Licensing, which is housed within the Department of LARA. Um, it's Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, um, known as LARA. And LARA has authority over all occupational licenses in Michigan, including the issuance of penalties, well, including the assessment of penalties as well. Um, also um, in that realm is the State Board of Accountancy. That is a nine member appointed board that's appointed by uh, the governor and they advise the uh, department on assessment of penalties for CPAs and they also 
um, interpret and create the administrative rules that um, each CPA has to uh, adhere to. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite complex. Um, CPAs also have to sit for a four segment. Fortunately, they used to have to do this, you know, all within a very, very short time frame. In fact, I think at one time it was, they had to go through it all the way, like from, from start to finish. Um, now they can take each segment at various times within a certain overall time period. So I, right now I think it's 18 months, but, um, we are hoping that it will get extended soon to 30 months to to allow a lot more time for, um, CPA or stu upcoming CPAs mm -hmm. to take the, um, all of the components. So, um, as I said, um, you know, th when you're so when you're working with a, an actual certified public accountant you know that they have had to again be licensed by the state they've had to take a, a very specific and rigorous exam they also um, are required to take continuing per, uh, continuing professional education also called cpe they have to take uh 40 hours of cpe every year and that includes eight hours of accounting and auditing and two hours of ethics. And one of those hours or one of those hours has to be um, Michigan specific ethics, which is only offered by the MICPA. Um, MIC, the MICPA offers courses that cover all of their uh, requirements. Um, so as I mentioned, they have to have that the eight and two accounts for 10 hours. And then they can also do 30 out. They also are required to do 30 hours of other. They, they can choose to do, you know, 30 hours of what's called ANA, and they can choose to do, you know, 10 of ethics. Um, but as a total, they need 40, and they have to complete that 40 in each year. It's not, and they, every, it's a two-year cycle, so they have to complete 40 hours in the first year, 40 hours in the second year, so a total of 80 when they renew their license every two years. And really, uh -huh. LaShawn, from the outside looking in, I was, that, that event that we met at was actually the first one put on by MSCPA that I've ever been to. Obviously, Chris, you've been going to these for, what, 60, 70 years? Um, you know what? <laughs> first of all, I'm going to say, I'm old enough to, I, my CPA exam, I took the CPA exam in May of, what doesn't matter, but it was a two-day event, handwritten, 16 hours of testing, two days in a row, and Gorgeous, Schwartz Creek, Michigan. Oh, nice! So yeah. This was yeah. so that was probably no. like predating a Scantron, even. Like <laughs> I remember when Scantron scan. Essay. A lot of it was essay, and the tricky part is, you know, the exam is is it's many of the questions is pick the best answer when you have multiple correct answers, uh, and it, it's tricky, but. But yeah, so anyway, for the Michigan the event we went to, I believe, is the forty fifth or forty sixth. Annual, so we, it, you know, it was so good. Yeah, that, everybody. That <laughs> oh, you know, it, it is what it, you know. When you say uh, my M I C P A, it's like my C P A. Yeah, because you found it. I get it. Been around for a long. Time. <laughs> You're not that much older than me, so as much, you know, you know what is I give you. It's all good. Oh, uh, but all joking aside, that event, I was, I was almost blown away. Right, you guys did such a great job. And this, well, by the yeah. way, is not. I don't want to, you know give too much of a plug on this and make it sound like it was sponsored or endorsed mm -hmm. in any ways. But wow. I, I was very shocked. The way you guys had really content set up um, and just the, the sessions and the presenters, it was all super engaging. Um, as engaging as some of the stuff could be, I overheard some that were, didn't exactly pique my interest, let's say. Mm -hmm. But the way it was presented was great. And just feeling that vibe from everybody there, I was, I, I mean this with all due respect to everybody who's listening to this that is a tax pro. I didn't see one pocket protector. There was not ink stains all over people's shirt. There was no coffee stains on shirt. It is not what you, what my my grandmother would refer to as her accountant. She didn't know what a CPA was. She wouldn't care. Which, by the way, that's how I met this guy on the show. Nobody's heard that before. But it really was a great group of people. And just seeing how the organization interacts with its members and really is there to support them, but not cram information down their throat, saying this is how you have to do it. This is it. That like very direct, it's, it's just very well. It's, it's, if anybody was interested in getting into that industry, 
it, it would be actually a great thing to go to. I mean, I don't know if you guys allow that, but I don't think it would turn anybody off is kind of what I'm getting at for the most part. So well, good job. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Katie Godalka lives, uh, leads our um, learning team and she is, and actually she now oversees the government relations team. So she's my direct boss. So I'm not saying this because she is, but she is fabulous. <laughs> We'll and, just repeat this. We'll put that little on a reel that just goes around you. and around. We'll not get a ringtone. Thank you. Especially at a performance review time. I'd appreciate there you it. Go. Let us um, know the day. But no, um, she is uh, fabulous. And her, she and her team just, I mean, I'm amazed. I've worked at, you know, several other organizations. And, you know, I've never seen events run as smoothly as they do at the MICPA. Um, and... You know, one of the things, too, I wanted to mention is um, the NICPA has a lot of experience with working with CPAs. You know, we've been in existence since 1901. Can you believe that? Um, I like Chris joke. I was going to say, you know, Chris, isn't your birthday right around there? <laughs> hey, you know what? So, uh, some people get better with uh, age like one. What? <laughs> So Katie does an amazing job. The thing with, with these events, and then I want to touch on some tax law stuff, sure. is that we we go to a lot of events. I know, humble brag for teaching tax flow in us, and we speak at a lot of events. And there's always going to be trouble. There's always going to be things that go wrong, but you wouldn't know it, right? They, they, they retain composure. They fix problems. They figure out a solution for a problem, and that's a, that's how you should work in general. That's how people uh, should operate. If you if you have a problem with something or, or challenge, come come with a solution or come with an idea. So absolutely. Um, so on the tax, so we know that, uh, like we said, there's there's certain tax laws that are created to encourage behavior. It could be social behavior. It could be um, uh, it could be economic or fiscal policy. It could be uh, environmental concerns but can you take us through how a tax law is made basically from maybe someone proposing it uh and let's say we could stick to the state level since that's where we're at um up to it actually gets that rubber stamp from the governor sure so um essentially what happens is you know a lot like most laws um tax law is no different you know it typically comes from citizens you know people who are you know uh feel that you know, certain things should be, certain taxes or certain laws should be in place to prevent certain taxes, <clears throat> excuse me. And, you know, um, so they, you know, meet with legislators and express their concerns. So essentially, um, the MICPA works very closely with um, the regulatory reform, finance and tax policy uh, committees within the Michigan legislature. And uh, one of the um, ways that we, because actually right now, um, mm -hmm. this is the first time in the Michigan legislature that we have not had a CPA, an actual CPA in the legislature. So they are really, um, you know, in need of assistance when it comes to what they should, you know, what type of bills they should propose and um, whether or not they should vote yes or no on certain tax legislation. So um, essentially, um, you know, a bill is um, a, a representative or senator presents a bill. Um, that bill is typically then uh, referred to a committee, um, generally one of the, especially with, in relation to tax taxes. Um, it's, you know, typically referred to regulatory reform or finance. And that committee takes the time to, you know, really pour over all of the details. Sometimes they may want to add things to it, subtract things to it. And then after they, uh, if they agree to on like a final version, um, let's say this starts off in the house, mm -hmm. then that will go, then it will be, go, then it will go over to the Senate. And then the Senate will, you know, also make changes. This, as you can imagine, this process can take a great deal of time. <laughs> right. Uh, going back and forth. Um, but at any rate, um, eventually, you know, the, the bill comes to the floor and it is voted on. And once it's voted on and it passes, then it, the, um, it, it's sent to the governor to sign. So that's pretty much how it works. 
Um, you know, it's, and this is why, you know, um, advocacy is so incredibly important. And, you know, it, with being with the MICPA, you know, we have very solid relationships with the Michigan Treasury and with Laura, you know, just to make sure that, you know, we, that again, our, our members and what they need is, you know, that the legislators are aware of this. Um, we have uh, task forces, um, like the SALT task force, for example, that, um, you know, we, that meets regularly. And the purpose of that is so that we can hear from the subject matter experts, you know, the actual CPAs as to, you know, what their issues and concerns are. And then we then go to the legislature or to our lawmakers, I should say, and, you know, express these concerns or ideas with them. And typically they're pretty open to them. It, does does that process include talking to anyone at the Department of Treasury about it? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Because here's well, sometimes tax laws have unintended consequences, and the probably yes. the biggest problem on the federal level right now are the new 1099K laws that they, mm -hmm. that if you go sell your T Sizzle tickets, John, that's Taylor Swift. I know. <laughs> I know Swifty. Hello. I didn't know that. I didn't know. <laughs> well, you're not the closet Swifty, but that's all right. I'm outing them right now on a live podcast. <laughs> you maybe live in a, but um, <laughs> but you know, all serious is if I bought Taylor Swift tickets and then and then my friends reimburse me for those tickets, I could I could get a 1099, and I'm not in the business of selling tickets. Right. Well, the issue is is I get it. The U.S. Congress said, wait, we have a lot of unreported income. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So let's enforce this 1099. Uh, new 1099 rules, and then the IRS is sitting there like, you are creating a huge headache for us on enforcement. Um, so a lot of the the SCPA and other organizations are advocating mm -hmm. for the 1099 threshold to go from $600 to up to $20,000. Mm -hmm. Probably more fair because that's $600 started, you know, in the 50s or 60s. I don't even remember when it came out. Mm -hmm. My point is it's great on the state level be that, that you are working with the Department of Treasury because I bet if Congress brought in the IRS and said, hey, what's the enforcement of this look like? They'd realize what they've created. And in fact, with that new, the new 1099K rules, they were supposed to go in place in 2022 and they got bumped an entire year into 23 here. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's why I asked on that. I do yeah. have a question, um, kind of a one more big question, is on... Uh -oh. um, uh, no, no, this is good. <laughs> well, you're at the state, side, state level. You've also worked in local government. Uh huh. Well, I don't think Livonia has a city income tax. Do they have us? No, they no, don't. We don't. Okay. Um, some cities do, but yes. When you have a federal law change, what the process look like for a state complying with that federal law? Uh, without getting any any details, obviously, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, there are tons of changes, and many states don't have limitations on bonus depreciation section 179 qualified business income deductions but what what's the state what do states think about maybe from a 30,000 foot view of okay a federal law just changed a certain deduction is now allowable um should what a major issue is in in the um uh in in the um uh business of uh that uh, t eight uh why am I blanking right now? But federally illegal activities, we'll say, that from a state perspective, you can get a tax deduction. We don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, um, on, on distilleries and marijuana and growth. But the point is, the question I'm asking is, the <laughs> state, states complying with federal tax law, what does that process look like from a 30,000 foot view? So, so um, that's a great question. So typically... When a law is passed down from the federal level, some laws are, it's set up where states are, have to automatically adopt them. Um, for example, um, with the flow through entity, entity tax, um, or also known as FTE, um, you know, that was adopted. Um, and, you know, Michigan is also following along with that. Um, and it's a good thing in the sense that it allows businesses to save on their taxes, you know, partnerships and S corporations. Um, but to your uh, previous statement, um, when 
Michigan started to roll this out, we realized that there were, you know, that there was this law made, but then the implementation was very complicated. And, um, you know, fortunately, you know, in conversations that we've had with Treasury, um, we we're able to, you, you were working to um, pro support legislation that should be coming out soon that will make some changes to those laws. So it just kind of depends on how the federal law is worded. Um, in most cases, the state will try to just adopt the federal law. But again, you know, there are many, there are so many different components to it. You know, there, it, it's probably way above my level of expertise to explain. <laughs> right. There's, but but there is often flexibility. There's unintended well. consequences because you also have to factor in the economic impact of yes. rule through entity. Uh, so for, mm -hmm. you know we've got a ten thousand dollars state and local income tax salt tax limitation on personal returns. Mm -hmm. So many of the states have allowed businesses to for, from a third grade level pay the personal tax for someone and take it as a business deduction. Yeah. And some states have complied, some have not. Um, but that, but obviously, a state that complies, that's going to, that's going to change the amount of tax revenue they might, they might receive. Yet, well, it's going to be a lot easier to collect that money from these entities than all these individual taxpayers, especially if those taxpayers don't live in the state of Michigan. So, yes, it's it's and and that's always that that's almost like with, with any law, you know, that comes down from the federal government. You know, it's you know, obviously we have you know. Senate state or I'm sorry, um, you know, U.S. senator and, you know, U.S. reps that, you know, um, advocate for us in, you know, in um, on the Capitol Hill. But, you know, it is still it, it's hard from the federal level and not everything that is passed at the federal level is, like you said, feasible or is going to work best for the residents of a particular state. Right. So um, the shoe doesn't so always fit. Exactly. I think is what I keep hearing in all these kids' movies that my yeah. daughter watches. Run. So all those lights. You know, I mean, one example of, of and then we're, we're going to put LaShawn on the hot seat, but they're fun. We're going to hit you with our five five questions, five questions that are okay. current tax related. But you look at the state of Michigan, obviously they, they don't want to lose residents that be, become snowbirds that go down you know, to, to Florida or wherever, Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, for six months and lose that state residency. So they've passed some rules to lessen the tax on retirement income. They've, they have a, they have a homestead property tax credit available for those people. So there's, there's certain rules that are encouraging them to maybe stay in Michigan as a Michigan resident. Uh, it's still go down, go down to these other States and visit, but stay a Michigan resident. So those are just, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've got, we've got a fun little segment at the end here. Okay. I'm going to rattle you off five questions. It could give us a one word answer or you can give us more than one word answer. Okay. And uh, they're all fun. So there's okay. no so nobody's responded back with go jump off a bridge yet for asking them. So <laughs> we're, we're very nice. Okay. Well, I'm ready. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, <laughs> you, what is your favorite cereal? Oh, I would say corn pops. Oh, we haven't had that one before. That's a first. That's a first, wow. okay. We had a couple of people at the audacity to not have a favorite cereal because they're too healthy. Uh, I wish that was the case for me. I love cereal. <laughs> oh, yeah. I actually, um, so my family loves cereal. I'm not a big cereal person. However, when I do eat cereal, it's corn pops. Mm -hmm. And um, I, one of my hobbies is uh, jigsaw, putting together jigsaw puzzles. Nice. And so in our kitchen, I have framed a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle that is all different types of cereal <laughs> well i'll just not that and we make it i mean we I, I was at like a craft show how i ended up at a craft show who the heck knows but I, <laughs> and my wife was with me and there was this little sign that said like uh it's too late to cook you're having cereal for dinner and i just put it up in the kitchen one day she had, <laughs> I, I bought that actually stayed up uh in the house uh with the decor I like so, that. Uh, all right. Next question. Your favorite TV show to binge watch? Oh, my goodness. This is like the easiest question ever. In fact, I mean, I pretty much binge watch it every day. 
The Office, hands down. I oh, absolutely yeah. love The Office. Um, mm-hmm. I could probably repeat pretty much verbatim from every episode, all the script. Um, it is just, and you know, it's interesting because I did not watch it while it was on the air. Mm-hmm. Um, I um, didn't start watching it until about three years ago. And now I'm like addicted to it. It's like it never gets old. Well, the two ladies, there's a podcast about The Office. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, oh, yes. The Office ladies. Yes. Yeah, my wife found it. <laughs> and uh, well, I listened to a couple episodes when we were driving. So it was it was good. I love The Office. Yeah. Um, all right. Oh, three more. If you could have okay. dinner with one person alive or past, who would it be? Um, I would have to say my father. Um, my father passed in 2020 and unexpectedly. And um, he was just a really, he was a great person, but he was always um, very encouraging. Mm-hmm. And he always... Um, thought that I could do more than what I was doing in my career. And um, it, it saddens me that, you know, he was not able to, you know, see me take on these leadership roles. However, it makes me happy to know that he would have expected me to do this. So, um, so yeah, I would say, I would say my dad, unless I have to choose a famous person, but. <laughs> no, I would not be, I, I, that's a, an amazing answer. I guarantee you, I'm, You'd be proud of you, and and uh, that's that's cool. Next that's are, are, are are more fun questions. Okay, this is going to be an interesting one because I know you're a mountaineer, and I know from our conversations, I know some of the your teams that you roll with. But favorite sports team? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so for your audience's information, information, I hate sports. I know nothing about sports. Um, my husband is a Spartan and he tries to tease me, you know, our, my school is doing a lot better than your school. And I'm like, I don't even know what my school is doing. I don't care. Um, but I guess if I had to choose, I would choose. Um, okay. So is it, I'm sorry, is it NFA? It's, it it's just like a B period. college pro, whatever team you'd like. Okay. So I would have to say it would be the Trojans at USC because that's where my son goes to school. And because of that, I have a lot of Trojan gear. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) An interesting little fact, too. So since my husband is a Spartan and my son started off his first year as a Spartan, um, I have, you know, like Spartan T-shirts and things like that. And again, since I'm not into sports, it it always takes me off guard when I'm in a store or something. And then I and someone says, Go green. And, you know, I'm thinking, why are they saying this to me? And then I'll realize it's because I have on a <laughs> Michigan State shirt. No, it's it not that. It's because you work for a tax pro organization. They yeah. saying go green, like dollars green. That's what That's they really exactly. thrive, right? Well, don't, no, John, don't let me start to think about that instead of the go, the, the, the appropriate response. Because, like, usually when I think of saying go white, they've already, like, kind of passed me. Um mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you know, the but, good uh, thing is you got the Trojans, you got the Spartans, you got some really yep. strong teams. You're not the, uh, no, no offense to the youth, University of California at Irvine Anteaters. Uh, you know, <laughs> so we got some strong, strong gear, strong swag that you're rolling with. Last yep. one, ideal weekend. Oh, let's see. Hmm. I got to come up with something besides binging on The Office. Cause hey, that sounds good, though. I pretty much do that every day. Um, let's see. My ideal weekend. Um, hmm. Probably to be on a boat. I, I love the water. Mm. And um, I would say my ideal weekend would just be spending time on a boat, mm-hmm. on a lake, um, with a glass of wine. There you go. My, right. Is that top? Put it here in the heart. <laughs> no, heck no. We'll put it in. The, we'll put that. We'll put that on repeat too. We're in the, you're, in, you're in the right state at least for a half of the year to enjoy that. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yes, yes. 
Um, the only old joking is the real oh, joke is that when I lived in South Carolina, they used to say that, or in Charleston, that we were a drinking town with a history problem. Oh, is, <laughs> is what their line was. So it's don't worry, Any, anything goes on this show. We keep it authentic. So. <laughs> Um, All righty. Well, well, Chris, how about, do you have any more questions for this individual that took the time out of her day to join us? No, I'm got I has all my questions. And I just want to say again, thank you, LaShawn, for coming on to the show and letting the listeners kind of dive into the, to the back end of the kitchen of tax laws and how tax professionals are, um, advocated for and in what some of the responsibilities are of course thank you so much for having me and i would love to come back so absolutely, absolutely. we're we'll gonna we're gonna have, we're gonna have to dive in to uh some tax tax taxes are made 2.0 yeah absolutely <laughs> well you will have an open invite anytime you just want to show up just show okay. up and we'll record it and chris let you off easy he didn't ask any crazy questions at the end so he must like you. He, he must like your organization. But honestly, I saw th- thank you again, kind of echoing what Chris said too, just for joining us and kind of giving us that rundown. I really like, I think Chris, you mentioned it perfect. What goes on in the kitchen behind all of this? And I mean, we have listeners in this podcast. I think we've hit every single state in the U.S. I don't know if we've had anybody from Hawaii yet. I'll have to check our, our I know we've had Alaska, if I do remember. And I, I think we're up to about 13, 14 countries, which is kind of cool. So it, it's nice seeing That's where everybody awesome. comes from. So obviously we're talking about Michigan a lot on here. That's where your organization is, MICA. Mm-hmm. But a lot mm-hmm. of it, you know, conveys to other states. I'm sure a lot of it co- treated the same or the process is very similar. So thank you well, for the someone, insight. If someone is watching from Hawaii, um, you know, I am available at any time to uh, come and talk more texts and <laughs> um, CPA stuff. So uh, just putting it out there. It, it's, it's on the, it, I'm sure it could be on the weekend on a boat. So it'll, it could be the ideal weekend. Right. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, thank you both so awesome. much for um, having me. I enjoyed this and I hope you have a great day. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And for everybody that's listening to this too, we'll put some links in the show notes. Be sure to follow those. Um, we actually have a couple of good questions too. We'll pop on our private Facebook group. You already know what that is. You'll hear it again here at the end of the show on the wrap up as well, but hop on there. Great topics as always. And really maybe if you have any questions for LaShawn, post them on there. We'll pass them along. I know, LaShawn, I believe you're on that Facebook group as well, too. So feel free to obviously respond to him directly. Um, but everybody be nice. She's not She's not in the government. Let's be sure. Don't, don't shred into her. She. She's here for your support. So Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you guys for joining. Thank you, everybody, for listening in to Teaching Tax Flow, the podcast. This has been a great one. We almost doubled the time that we usually do. We were having so much fun. So as I always like to say as we close it up, we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with us today on this episode. Obviously, this is something you probably didn't know a whole lot about, but maybe made some assumptions there on how these things we refer to as taxes go from really an idea or a thought or a suggestion, um, put into the tax code. So looking at this again, thank you so much, LaShawn Thomas, for joining us from the Michigan Association of CPAs. MICPA is what they go by. Um, We look forward to having you back again so we can dive into this in a little bit more detail, maybe get down to the nitty gritty on a couple of these topics. Um, I know for a fact this is going to trigger all kinds of questions in our email inbox from people wanting to know a little bit more about some specifics. So we look forward to those questions. Um, We welcome those. Please, anybody send those over to us on any of our social media channels or just shoot us an email at hello at teachingtaxflow.com. Until next time. The content of this podcast does not constitute an offer of securities. Offerings can only be made through an offering memorandum, and you should carefully examine the risk factors and other information contained in the memorandum. The content provided is for educational purposes only. We encourage you to seek personalized investment advice from your financial professional. For all tax and legal advice, please consult your CPA or attorney. Investment advisory services are offered through Cabin Advisors, a registered investment advisor. Securities are offered through Cabin Securities, a registered broker-dealer.